Welcome to Target Market Insights, a multifamily and marketing podcast. Each week, John Kasman interviews multifamily and marketing experts to teach you how to find the best places to invest, attract investors, and grow your portfolio. You are listening to Target Market Insights with your host, John Kasman. Welcome to Target Market Insights, the multifamily and marketing show. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Now, if this is your first time listening to the show, welcome. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And if you are a returning listener, well, thank you again for coming back to the show. Be sure to leave us a rating and review so we can understand what you love about the show and how we can make you work harder for your investing needs. Today, we've got a good one. We're going to be talking to Zach Happenstall. Zach Kapsensal is the CEO and co-founder of Rise 48 Equity in Phoenix, Arizona. He is also an official member of the Forbes Real Estate Council. Now, he went on to earn his MBA from Grand Canyon University and became part owner of a healthcare company after years of grinding out in sales. Searching for a way to gain back control of his time and achieve passive cash flow, Zach sold his shares in the healthcare company and discovered multifamily investing. He closed his first deal in 2019, and today his company, Rise 48 Equity, has a portfolio of over $175 million of assets. Let's welcome to the show, Zach Haftenstahl. Hey, thanks so much, Sean, for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. I mean, I remember you and I first spoke back in 2018 and, and you were kind of giving me tips and, and insight when I was just trying to get into it. So, you know, I appreciate our friendship and, and I'm grateful to be on the show. Thanks so much, man. Zach, you've actually, you've been amazing since then. So it's great to see the growth and and the trajectory that you've had. I went over your bio at a high level. Take a minute or two and give us a little bit more background. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, John. Yeah. So, I mean, I was, I was born and raised here in Phoenix, pretty much lived here my entire life. Um, I I played football at a small school in Colorado. I wanted to be an NFL player, you know, realized that wasn't going to happen. So I wanted to be a sports reporter. So I got a journalism degree. Um, here at Arizona State, and I was a live news anchor, sports reporter, Arizona PBS for a short time, and then realized, you know, what? I don't want to do that either. So I, I was delivering medical equipment nights and weekends while I was going to college to pay for school, and I kind of parlayed that into healthcare marketing. So after I realized I don't want to do journalism, you know, I got into to hospice care. I, I started out as a marketer, um, became a director of marketing and, and a co-owner, you know, over a four-year span. So I was blessed to, you know, have made good money, you know, make a six-figure income in my early to mid twenties, you know, got my MBA, paid off all my debt, bought a house. So I was really fortunate to build a good foundation, but you know, at some point, John, I just got burnt out. You know, I was just, I wasn't passionate about that. Um, it, it's always kind of, what have you done for me lately? You know, when you're in a, a sales position like that. So 2018, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do or, or how to do it, but I just knew I didn't want to be doing that. And I, I wanted to try to, you know, create some type of passive income to, to gain control of my time. So in January of 18, I quit my job, you know, sold my equity in that company and decided I'm going to live off savings for at least the next 12 months and, and figure out how to, how to somehow, you know, make money through real estate. And I, I really had no experience, um, no family. I come from like a lower middle class family. So I didn't have any like, you know, rich uncle or anything like that. Um, I just started out kind of like listening to podcasts like yours, John, reading books, grinding it out. I was initially looking at flipping homes because I don't want to do that. Um, then I looked at mobile home parks, you know, I cold called several mobile home park owners trying to buy something on a seller carry that didn't work out until I finally realized, you know, multifamily and syndication is what I want to do. So, so long story short, you know, it was 14 months, um, a, an arduous path really of me just burning through money um, be, from the time that I quit the job till we closed the first deal, the first multifamily property. And when that was in, we closed the first one in uh, February of 19 of 2019. And we've been very blessed since then to really, you know, gain momentum, build up the syndication platform. So we've now acquired about, you know, 200 million um, all here in Phoenix. Since then, we have another 107 million, I think, under contract. So we've just been blessed, you know, to really build out that momentum, get the experience and then kind of scale out our our syndication platform here in, in the Phoenix market. Man, that, that's phenomenal growth, right? I mean, you just talked about having $107 million under contract, you know, being at around $200 million right now under assets, under management, and really all this happening in the last, you know, two plus years. So from that moment, right, when you made that decision to leave the W-2, get out of the sales side and really lock in on real estate, you mentioned that it took 14 months before that first deal was done. 
take me back to that time because I, I can only imagine you're looking at your savings account. You know, you're looking at the funds dwindling down. I think we started talking prior to that, right? During that time frame where you were looking, and that's right. I can only imagine the kind of pressure, right? So, so talk to me about that, right? What was it? What what did you go through? And for someone who's looking for that first deal, you know, that person who is listening to us talk right now, they're waiting on that first deal. What advice would you give them? Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question, John. And you're right. I mean, when you and I first started talking, I had never even done a deal. You know, and that's why I was appreciative of your time. You know, I was looking up to you and appreciative of any of the tidbits you gave me at that time. And so, you know, um, it was tough, man, because I went from having a, a healthy six figure base salary and I was getting fat bonuses. Make, I was making over 200K a year at that point with bonus and salary. So I was used to getting fat checks every two weeks, you know, and I would wake up in the morning when I was doing the healthcare marketing and I knew what I had to do. Right. And I was, you know, in all humility, I was, I was elite in that industry and I was dominating that, that industry, but that was probably part of the reason I didn't feel challenged anymore. So, you know, then, then I quit the job. I wake up every morning. I don't know what the hell I'm supposed to do that day. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how to move the needle. Like, do I listen to a podcast? Do I read a book? Do I go reach out to some more brokers? Well, I just reached out to them last week. I don't want to bug them. And it's very intimidating, you know, because, you know, you don't, I've never done anything like this. You know, these are very big numbers. They're big buildings and you feel like super wealthy people must own these. And I'm just a nobody coming in here with no experience. So, you know, it was, it was really tough um, kind of grinding through. And and like you mentioned, you know, just seeing the cash just burn, you know, cause I, at that time I had about 260 K of cash, which I had relentlessly saved following, following the Dave Ramsey plan you know, the, the previous four years. And then I got a bump from the equity that I sold. So I had about 260 K and I was burning through it quick, man. I mean, cause I was living off of it. I was going to conferences and, and it just sucks when you don't have money coming in. Um, so so it, it was tough. And I mean, in order, in, in regards to kind of the advice I would give to people is, and, and it sounds cliche or whatever, but you have to just keep grinding and you do have to keep the faith. And it's, it's all about like, what are you doing each day? Like, what are you doing to move the needle? And initially, you know, it was listening to podcasts, reading books to gain the foundational knowledge of how this all works. But at some point, you know, and it comes quick, that doesn't get you anywhere. You have to actually take action. Right. And so I then started to cold call brokers, property managers, lenders, attorneys, insurance brokers, and set up face to face meetings. You know, I put on a suit, you know, fake it till I make it. You know, I'm nervous, shaking, but I don't show it. Right. So that's what you kind of what you have to do is just fake it till you make it and, and really present yourself as somebody who's credible. Um, and so, so yeah, that, that was really the biggest thing was really starting to take action and really starting to crank the volume of touring properties with brokers, cranking the underwriting and constantly making offers. And I think the biggest thing that I learned through the process is you cannot be afraid to fail. Okay. You have to just take shots, take shots, take shots, keep fighting and don't be afraid to fail because you really only fail if you quit. You know what I mean? It's like now somebody might look at me like, Oh, cool. You bought all these deals. You've done really well, but if you would have looked at me nine, 10 months into me quitting my job, you would have thought I was a complete failure, right? But I didn't quit. And so I'm I'm not a failure. So I think that's the biggest thing is like, you have to have that long-term mentality. And the biggest thing is you have to take action and and action means, you know, find comp at least one or two complimentary partners who are passionate, have complimentary skill sets that you have, you can rely on, you can communicate with, which is really hard to do. It took me a long time to find somebody I could trust and work with. And then you have to constantly be cranking volume of tours, underwriting and offers. And, and through that process, you know, you'll gain the respect of the brokers. Even if you're not getting close to the purchase price, they're going to start to respect your grind and your communication. And so that was really the biggest thing, I think, as far as breaking through and getting that first deal finally. Yeah, man, I love what you just talked about is like, you know, not really being afraid to fail, take an action and understanding that, listen, you've got to get your foundation. you got to understand that the language, the lingo, you have to understand what it is you're doing. So when you're talking to people, you can look credible. Um, I want to challenge you a little bit on the faking it till you make it piece, because I think sometimes people misunderstand uh, what what the meaning is and the intent behind that. You know, what I heard you say was, You took action, massive action daily, you know, touring properties, underwriting, making offers. If you're doing that constantly, you're going to get better and better and better. And if people see you taking this action, showing up every day, you're building credibility. Even if you've never done a deal, right? If If you've analyzed every deal I send 
if you are touring multiple properties, you're going to get sharper and sharper and sharper. And at a certain point, even though you don't have a deal under your belt, you're actually going to be credible and you're going to be knowledgeable. And you're going to be in a position to take down a deal. So it's not faking it till you make it in the sense of, you know, um, misrepresenting uh, your knowledge. Because I mean, listen, you, you'll get exposed. If you're sitting down with a broker and you're asking questions, you have no idea how to talk the lingo. You'll get exposed and that'll be that. But you kept yeah. doing it, you know, and I think the brokers recognize, hey, this is a guy who keeps showing up. He's serious. He's committed to this. This is a guy who pushed all of his chips in and is going for this. And I think that's something that is really commendable. And I, I want to make sure you get your, you know, your just do because it wasn't just, you know, putting on a suit and smiling. It was the fact that you showed up relentlessly on a daily basis and and made it happen. So kudos yeah. to you, man. And I uh, appreciate you sharing kind of what it took for you to go from, you know, where you were to, to where you're at right now. Um, let's talk about that first deal. How did you find it? What was it about that deal or, or however it came to be that allowed you to actually move forward and do that deal that was different from the previous, you know, 12, 13 months when you started looking at deals and, and those didn't pencil out or those didn't work? Yeah, no, great question, John. And, and you made a great point about it's all about reps, right? Repetition, repetition. You start to learn. And it's funny because I, I talk to a lot of people now. And I say, you know, in Phoenix and probably across the country, everything is so tight, right? It's a needle in the haystack to find a deal that makes sense. Most people will not even recognize a good deal when they see one, okay? Because they don't know the submarket, they don't know the underwriting, et cetera. And that was the problem I had initially, okay? So the first deal, there was no magic. It was a marketed deal, okay? Um, I had met the broker before. I had established some rapport, but he, I had never done a deal, so I don't have any real credibility. But by that time, I had personally underwritten over 30 deals, you know, and the first, you know, the first five, 10 and well, all of them, you get really frustrated because none of them are even close. And you think, am I going crazy? Am I doing this right? And, and most people, you may or may not be doing it right, but um, you, you may be doing it right. And most deals are not going to pass. Okay. That's what you need to know. So it's very frustrating and it's a volume game. But as you start to learn more about the property management company, you're going to work with budgets, the sub market, loss to lease, all these little things, you can really refine your underwriting to make it work. So this was a marketed deal. You know, it had just been blasted. Um, we went out and toured it. We underwrote it and it penciled. And I was shocked. I was like, wait, am I doing this right? Okay, this one actually makes sense in the model. What did I miss? I must have missed something. What did I miss? Yeah, yeah. Go through the, go through the model over and over. Um, and, and it penciled. I was like, oh, wow. So at that time, I had met my partner, Robert, and Robert really brought the network liquidity because I didn't have network liquidity at the time to qualify for these loans. And so him and I, we made an offer and then it got accepted. I'm like, oh crap, this got accepted. Like, what do we do now? It was so scary because we can't back out because we're going to look bad to the broker. We're, gonna, we're worried about ruining our reputation, um, et cetera. But if we go forward, we have to actually raise the money and go, go through with this. And so it's like, okay, it's go time. And so each of us deposited 25K, you know, um, we go through our due diligence and this was a 36 unit, $3.4 million deal, John, we needed to bring 1.4 of equity. And our plan was to syndicate it, right? We listen to all the podcasts. They say, if you find a good deal, the money pours in. We talked to all these people oh, and then the, in the previous month said, yeah, I'm interested. And we thought we had all these people. I had a list on my phone and I had a sell spreadsheet of people to reach out to. We get it under contract. We start reaching out to people. Nobody's interested. Nobody's interested. 30 days go by. We're done with our inspections. The money's now non-refundable. So I'm, I'm 25K hard. So it was my partner, Robert. And we're like freaking out. We're like, oh crap. Like nobody wants to invest. We don't have a track record. Um, it was kind of scary. So I had about 165K left of my savings. I put all one, I put 160 into it. I was almost all in. Robert put nearly 300. I get a call um, from a lady one, one day that I had met at a conference. Um, and, and, and she basically just called. I don't even know how she found out to this day. I never really asked her, but she's like, Hey Zach, I heard you have this deal in Phoenix under contract. Well, I just sold this 12 unit deal in Seattle and I want to do a 1031 exchange. So how about I 1031, I bring 650 K and we do a tenant in common or tick structure. I said, that sounds great. Let's do it. And I said, well, what's a tick structure? I don't know what that is. <laughs> that sounds great. great. What, what is yeah, that? Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. I'm let's in. do it. I have no yeah, idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so I learned what the tick structure was, a tenant in common. We brought her in. We found a couple more people. I had just met Bikron, who's now our CFO at Rise 48, and had a call with him um, a couple days earlier and, and got him to put in a big chunk, like 150. So we had like five or six people who at least put in 150 or more. And long story short, John, we bootstrapped the deal. We put it together. 
We did not, it was not a syndication. It was originally intended to be one, but it, we didn't do that. We did a tenant in common. And in hindsight, that was probably the best thing for us, you know, because we were able to learn firsthand how to execute a value add plan, how to do asset management, et cetera, you know? And so it actually went really well. Um, we ended up selling it last year in October, 2020. Um, it was a 21 month hold, you know, we almost two X the money on a project level. So it was, it was a really good deal for us and, and really gave us a lot of confidence, experience and momentum, you know, going forward in, in the market. And that's kind of what helped us to really get on a string since then. So. I love it, man. I mean, a lot of things there to take away. And, um, you know, I, I love the fact that as I'm talking to you, like, um, I'm going to say humility, but I, I just, I appreciate the forthright, uh, conversation about your journey, right. And just understanding like the challenges that you face and it's tough. I mean, anytime you're raising money for your first deal and you don't have a track record, you can have all the conversations you want to have up until that point. Right. The reality right. is when you have a live deal and now you have to go and ask for the, the hard commitment and people listen, people are nice in general. But when yeah. it's time to invest, you know, if they got some trepidation, that's when it's going to come out. And you may have thought you had about a million dollars lined up to do these deals. But, yeah. you know, when you get to that point where it's time to say, hey, we've got this deal. Are you ready to invest? Well, wait a minute. I got a bunch more questions now. And I think many yeah. first time investors are a little surprised by that. It sounds like you guys got caught with it as well, you yeah. know, by the, the powers that be. You had this tick situation, uh, which I want you to explain in a moment. And then you were able to, you know, get it from other investors, other folks who were committed. You pushed all in with your chips and you're able to make this deal work. So first of all, let's explain what uh, tenants in common actually means. When is it used? And then I want to talk about, you know, kind of uh, how you scale from there. Yeah, great question, John. So, I mean, a, a tenant in common, also known as a tick, is the acronym. You know, it, it's similar to like a, a joint venture or a JV. Right. The, the real advantage of doing a tick structure is you can you can take advantage of 1031 exchanges, which is what we did. So, I mean, you know, let, let's say you and I, John, we want to do a deal together and you have and we want to just do their own cash. Right. Well, let's say you have 900 K and I have 100 K. Right. And we need a million of equity. Well, we can do a, a tenant in common, which is similar to a joint venture uh, where, you know, for asset protection purposes, you're going to want to create an, an LLC to hold in your interest. Right. So you'll create what's known as your tick LLC or your tenant in common. So you'll be one tenant in common LLC owning the property directly. I'll have my tenant in common LLC owning the property directly as well. And the, the little different things about the legalities of a tick that most people don't understand or know is that, I mean, as far as ownership structure, you're gonna, John's gonna own 90% because you have 900K. I'm gonna own 10%. But in regards to all the voting rights, all the decisions, everything, it has to be mutually agreed upon, okay? Everything has to be a unanimous decision. So when you do a tick, you need to make sure that you're, you're getting into the deal with people you really know and trust, right? And that you don't want to have a conflict with. It's really designed, you know, for a, a smaller number of investors with larger investment checks, um, as opposed to having a ton of different people. Because not only do you have to all have unanimous um, decision making, but everybody has to play an active role. Okay, there are no LPs. There are no passive investors. You do not sign a PPM. Um, it is not, you don't get an exemption with the SEC like you do with the traditional syndication. So, you know, it's really like a joint venture. The advantages of doing the tick structure, some people might say, why don't you just do a JV? It doesn't make sense. Good question. The advantages with the tick is that you can 1031 into it and 1031 out of it without really disrupting, you know, the, the compliance regulations of the 1031. So for example, in that particular deal, we had three tenants in common. OK, I had a tenant in common LLC, which I was the manager of. And I had a couple people in there. Robert had his own tenant in common LLC and he had one person. And Elisa, she had she was the 1031 exchange. She she had her tenant in common LLC and she had one person in there. OK, so the three of us, Elisa, Robert and I, we were the managers of our respective tick LLCs. But you can have members in your entity as well to bring money as long as they're playing an active role and they're involved on the PM calls, et cetera. So upon the exit what we decided to do is Robert and I, you know, we wanted, we basically did not want to do a 1031 exchange after we sold because we wanted liquidity so that we had more earnest money to put up for syndications. Whereas Elisa, she was already 1031 and 650 into it. She almost doubled that, right? In about 21 months. So she had a big chunk. So upon exit, she decided to 1031 exchange her pot, which is now 
almost 1.2, you know, into a different deal. So she 1031 into it and she 1031 out of it. Right. Whereas Robert and I, we said, we're just going to pay capital gains. We want the liquidity and we didn't. So that, that's kind of the cool thing about the tick is you can 1031, 1031 out. We could have also done a scenario where all three of us said, you know what? We all want to partner on the next deal and let's all roll together. And we could have all done a 1031 together and had three ticks again in the next deal. So it really allows you to leverage, you know, the benefits of deferring the capital gains through that 1031 exchange. And, and it gives you a lot more flexibility, but there are, you know, there are intricacies. I mean, it was a Freddie Mac small balance loan and Freddie Mac, they'll, they'll make you sign what's called a tick agreement, which basically says that because you have the legalities of the unanimous decision, that you're agreeing by signing this tick agreement with Freddie Mac, that you're not going to have any frivolous lawsuits or disagreements that would jeopardize the deal, right? Because Freddie Mac is saying, listen, we're the senior debt. We're the biggest investor in this thing. We don't want you guys getting into disagreement that puts the property in jeopardy. So there's different things to, to consider um, as opposed to doing a syndication, but that's, that's basically the premises of the tick. No, I appreciate you walking through that. I mean, tenants yeah. in common is a term that maybe folks are familiar with, but there are a lot of intricacies that maybe, unless you've actually done it, uh, you may not know some of these things. And there are a lot of advantages. And what I would say is, you know, if you are looking at a 1031 exchange or you have investors that you're working with who have a 1031 exchange, this is something you should look into more. So certainly do your research, you know, talk to, you know, your CPA, your attorneys and understand it a little bit more for your situation. But it's a great way to solve a problem. And I love the fact that you guys had to get pretty creative to make that first deal happen. Let's fast forward, right? So you get that first deal done. And then how, how fast is it before you get that next deal? Yeah, good question, John. So we closed the first one in February of 2019. We got our contract in October of 18. It was a long four month escrow. We closed in February and you know we were like, we had a lot of momentum, like let's find the next one. And so we got the next, the next one under, we got the next one under contract in April, two months later. And that was a portfolio of two deals. One um, was a, a 59 unit in Scottsdale. And the other was a 76 unit in Phoenix. And so we ended up doing another tick on the 59 unit because the dynamic, the economics of the underwriting just worked out better. And because it was Scottsdale it was an A plus location, we had a few investors um, that guys are like, Hey, we want to be active. You know, we, we have big chunks. We saw what you guys just did on this other one um, that wanted to get in. So like, okay, we'll do the tick on this one. It makes sense. And then we ended up doing our very first syndication on that 76 unit Phoenix deal. So the next one was a portfolio of two properties, one escrow, like 130 something units. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of that work. So basically we, we got that one under contract in April and then we closed, you know, that summer. So it, it was very quick. Yeah. And, and, we, and that, those, those again, John, were marketed deals. Okay. So there was no magic sauce on that one either. You know, we went through, we felt like we had a better understanding of the submarket just from doing a lot of underwriting, touring properties. And then we got into best and final. And because we had more experience, you know, we realized, okay, let's get more aggressive on our terms. Like we'll put up more earnest money, and we'll do an access agreement instead of a full due diligence. Um, and, you know, we, we were able to just get there and make it work, you know, so that, that was the next one. And then from there, we started really getting momentum. But, you know, I remember in that best and final, I was able to point to the broker that sold us the first deal as a recommendation to this broker. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, I used to work with that guy. I trained him. Like, I trained him how to be a broker. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's, it's a relationship game, like everybody says, and it's true, right? And it's a local game. And so the, it's really a snowball effect. So once you break through and you start meeting these professionals, you meet the PMs, the, the attorneys, the insurance guys, they all know each other, you know, or there's, there's reputations that follow people, you know, which can help you or hurt you, right? So you have to be careful with, with uh, not burning any bridges too, but that really helped us to leverage that because we just closed the deal and we were able to get that other broker to vouch for us. It's awesome to hear, man. I love the fact that you're able to make that deal happen. Just to, to clarify, you mentioned it was a portfolio play and you syndicated and you also did a little bit of a, you know, a tick structure. What did you separate the two properties? We did. Um, yeah, we okay. had so two separate properties and two separate loans. So basically it was the same seller. He wanted to sell both of them. And he said, I'm willing to sell one. He said, I'm willing to sell one off to two different groups but he basically had an all in price that he was looking to hit for both. And there were a lot of, there were, I remember specifically, there were 14 offers on the portfolio and, but some offers were only for one or the other. Right. And, and there were very few that were for both. And even if the, even the ones that were for both, they couldn't get to the price he wanted. So we tried to underwrite on both as a syndication, but by, by, by changing the Scottsdale deal to a tick, we were able to push it a little bit to the price and make the deal work. 
and, and it was very conservative, you know? And so those have both gone really well. You know, the Scottsdale one is cash flowing like crazy. We just want to hold it long-term. We'll probably refi it soon because there's a very few amount of us in an A-plus location. The yeah. 76 unit, we're actually listing for sale tomorrow. We're bringing it out to market. So it's kind of funny. You know, that's been about two years or so, and that'll be a really good one for our investors. So that was, that was an example of us being able to get creative and strategic, you know, in order to, to win those deals and appeal to the seller. Yeah, I love it, man. I love it. Let, let's talk about the Phoenix market real quick. You know, so sure. Phoenix is a hot market. Uh, we know that. What's driving that? What's driving the growth? What's driving the demand? Why is Phoenix one of the hottest markets in multifamily? We are seeing like the perfect storm of fundamentals for Phoenix right now in, in favor of investors and landlords. Okay. So, I mean, it was just announced the U.S. Census Bureau just announced Phoenix for the fifth consecutive year as number one in the country for population growth. Pre COVID, Phoenix was already number one for population growth. Since COVID, everything's accelerated here, John. It's crazy. So RealPage just announced a couple of weeks ago the trailing 12 months of May 2021, trailing 12, which is through the heart of COVID, we saw 15.7% organic rent growth here. Okay. They're now starting to call this place the Silicon Desert because you have all these Silicon Valley tech companies relocating here. Google, Apple, um, have already built huge manufacturing centers. I mean, since 2017, Amazon has built 17 distribution centers and employed over 20,000 people just in the last few years. They're actively building more. You got Intel is building, they just announced a few months ago, they're building a $20 billion manufacturing plant. You've got Taiwan Semiconductor building a $35 billion uh, manufacturing plant. So what we're seeing here, John, is there's literally not enough inventory of workforce housing for all the people that are coming here. And especially since COVID, we're seeing a huge surge of people coming predominantly from blue states like California, Washington State, New York, New Jersey. They're leaving a higher cost of living, higher tax environment coming to Phoenix, which has a lower cost of living. And, and now we have the jobs that support it. I mean, I just read an article, the Milken Institute is saying that Phoenix is a top 10, top 10 market from 22 2020 to 2030 for new tech jobs. So we have all these new jobs. People are making, you know, as much, if not more than they were making before coming here. And it's just crazy. That's why we're, we're seeing this, this tremendous growth. I mean, and this is my last little stat and I'll stop spitting out stats, but the, the, the BEA, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is a U.S. federal agency, they just announced last that last year, Phoenix was number one in the country for personal income growth, 8.4% which is a powerful statistic for us because it shows that, you know, these tenants could absorb these rental increases. And so, I mean, you look at some markets right now, like, like Dallas, for example, we look at a lot of different markets just from statistically, you already put out some data that showed like new supply versus absorption. Well, Dallas has a ton of new supply that's not being absorbed. Phoenix actually has more absorption than new supply. You know what I mean? So you've got people coming here, they're making really good money. Um, they have a lower cost of living. There's not enough inventory for them for workforce housing. And that's why we're seeing such a surge here. And so, I mean, I was born and raised Phoenix. I lived here my entire life and I'm driving on the freeway some days, John, like at noon or 1 PM and everything is backed up. It's like rush hour. You know what I mean? It's like in the middle of the day and we never had this before. It's, it's insane. And so, you know, there's just so many people coming here. There's a lot of good jobs and all the fundamentals are, are really strong. So we we think internally from a Phoenix that, you know, long-term, it's a very well insulated and if not one of the most conservative markets in the country because the fundamentals are so strong. We think the velocity of this growth has to slow probably 24 to 36 months from now, okay? Because at some point we're gonna hit an affordability issue with rents. You can't just keep jacking up rents like this and not expect to see that regardless of job growth. So, you know, we're saying internally, we really want to pound it in the next 24, 36 months. And obviously within reason, right? The deals have to make sense and pass our, our conservative stress tests. And then we think the velocity may start to slow. We still think there will be consistent growth beyond that, but that's kind of what we're seeing here locally. And it's just, it's just been tremendous. So it's safe to say you like the market. Yeah, we're kind of falling in the market. Uh, maybe like it. Right. And we're only no, focused I mean, listen, here right now. Yeah, we're only yeah. focused on Phoenix. That's right. I mean, listen, great, great information. Obviously, you know the market extremely well. Great stats and great insights as far as what's driving the Phoenix market. And your, your point on absorption, I think, is a great one to think about because it's easy to look at population growth and job growth. And those are certainly important things. But there's a supply and demand factor that we have to do, right? And yeah. really understanding what's the, and for those who are listening to this, when we talk about absorption, what we're really saying is 
how many new apartment buildings or new apartment units are coming online? Uh, because it's great that you have all these new people moving, but if developers are building brand new apartments faster than yep. people are actually moving, that actually could hurt you know, rents and make rents go down because of the amount of new supply. So it is important to kind of keep your eye on that as well. Um, you know, I want to get back to kind of the growth that you've accelerated and you've seen because, you know, as you talked about the challenges you've had raising capital for that first deal, you know, the second deal, even you did kind of a tick structure. You mentioned that you've got over $100 million of real estate under contract right now. And I know that raising capital has certainly uh, become easier and easier as you've grown. What are some of the things that you attribute that to? I mean, outside of obviously getting a building a track record, but what else have you done to start attracting capital and make that process a little bit easier? Yeah, no, it's a great question, John. I mean, so my thing was the reason I was so confident going to that first deal to syndicate was because I did have a large network of physicians and healthcare business owners that I had worked with directly. And these are the guys that were saying, yeah, I'll invest with you. But until they saw, you know, you actually close one and perform and even selling that first one gave us a ton of momentum to go out and show our investors, look, this is what we did. You know, we just sold our second deal a couple couple months ago. And that was, that was a home run as well. So that obviously the full cycle gives you a ton of momentum. Um, and then even just paying the distribution, we do monthly distributions, you know, we've never missed in a distribution. So when investors start to see that they're getting their cash flow hit their account every month, the, the biggest, the biggest, and I'll get into the marketing here in a sec, John, but the biggest, truly the biggest momentum for us has been referrals. Okay. So we're getting a lot and it's like a web, right? So like a lot of our current and previous investors are referring their colleagues, their professional colleagues, their friends, their family, and it's really just kind of taken off. And then this person referred you somebody and this person referred you somebody, and they've all been really happy. From the marketing side, you know, everything, all the credit goes to my wife, Grace. So Grace is our, our VP of marketing. She does all the social media. I am terrible at social media and I don't even like it, John. So believe it or not, I don't even really get in on my social media pages. Grace runs my LinkedIn and my Facebook and all the posts are her. Okay, I do reply and she tells me stuff and I reply and I reply to DMs, things like that. Um, but basically, you know, we've been able to really leverage like the branding and the marketing from a social media perspective. And, and it's tough because, you know, we've worked now with a few different SEC attorneys over the years and we're very sensitive of that and, and being very careful to be compliant, right? Because you cannot be soliciting deals and you can't be conditioning the market. So we always ask our SEC attorneys and they're literally signing off on the posts that we do. And now we really know what's compliant. But, you know, now that, especially this year, now that we started to buy more deals and we really built out our infrastructure, you know, we do all the construction management in-house now, you know, we, we have a pretty, pretty built out infrastructure for asset management. Um, now I'm going to the properties to do property updates just to show people, you know, what we've been doing. And so I'm providing genuine content of what we're doing, saying we've renovated X amount of units in X amount of days. This is our pro forma rent. This is where we're actually achieving. You know, we already completed roofs, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, the whole goal is going out there to provide, you know, quality content. I'm not trying to be like a salesy guru type of guy. I'm just saying this is what we're doing with the properties. But the whole goal internally is to drive people to my Calendly page. Okay. So you provide quality content and, and people get interested through that and they want to set up a call. Okay. So it, it drives people to set up a call and we've modified our Calendly page to create qualified leads. Okay. I was getting a ton of lenders, different vendors calling me, harassing me. And I was taking all those calls for the longest time, John, because I want to be nice, abundance mindset, et cetera. But at some point it just sucks the life out of you and it takes all your time. So we've, we've literally put on the Calendly. I understand this is not an opportunity to solicit services. I'm interested in passive investing. They have to fill this stuff out. And it's kind of funny. I've had lenders email me directly say, Hey Zach, I wanted to set up a call, but I don't want to lie to you on your Calendly. I'm trying to sell you on this. So anyways, it's giving us qualified leads so I can set up calls with people who are genuinely interested in reaching out to us, you know, about talking. And so then I can vet them, establish that pre-existing substantive relationship, you know, and then months down the road, they've, they've seen more of our marketing. They've seen more of our email blasts than they're interested. Right. And, and that's kind of how it's been an organic thing. So between, you know, the referrals, um, the marketing and setting up the calls, you know, that's really been the biggest thing for us. 
God, I appreciate you sharing that. Zach, you've crushed it, man, over the last couple of years. I'm amazed at the growth you've had. Uh, you mentioned earlier on you were kind of learning from me. Now I'm actually learning from you, man. I appreciate all the growth you've had. And it's just great stuff. And I think that's the, the thing I love most about this business is it really is supportive in the sense that, you know, yeah. um, you know, you could sit and humbly watch someone like blow past you and applaud. You know, I mean, I watch your stuff and I'm just so excited for you and the growth that you've seen. And it's amazing to me. And, you know, I pick up little nuggets here and there from the stuff that you're doing. So I hope our audience got a lot of value from Zach's story, from what he's doing. For folks who want to learn learn more about you, maybe want to learn more about investing in some of the projects you have going on. What's the best way to get in touch? Yeah, first of all, thanks so much, Sean, for the kind words, man. I really, I really value our relationship. So thanks for having me on. Um, people who are interested, they can just go to our website, rise48, R-I-S-E, 48equity.com. And you can actually set up a call, you know, through Calendly that way. You can also email me directly. Feel free to email me. I'm happy to help however I can. Zach, Z-A-C-H at rise48equity.com. I'm always happy to get on a call. Awesome. Let's quickly get into our bullseye round. You ready? Let's do it. All right, give me a failure or an apparent failure that set you up for later success. Yeah, I think um, honestly, like relying on the property management company to do all the construction, the first couple deals, and trusting that they would hit the budget and the schedule um, was just a big, big mistake by us. And you don't know until you actually get into it. And every PM tells you they'll do it. Um, you know, so we've had management companies that they don't stay on budget, they don't stay on schedule, and then you're always having these meetings, and you have to fire them. Uh, bring in other construction companies, et cetera. And it gets to be a pain in the butt. Now, you know, we have the staff to vet construction companies, constantly managing them. We have a construction coordinator, John, who literally spends 40 hours a week walking units that are under renovation, making sure these, crew, these, these crews are staying on schedule. So you got to get the construction component down because at the end of the day, this is value add multifamily and you have to be adding value in renovating units. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Yeah, I mean, I talked about Calendly. I mean, I, everybody kind of knows that one, it's kind of obvious. I, I wish I was more savvy with this stuff. I'm not that good. I mean, LinkedIn has been good to drive people to Calendly. We use HubSpot as a CRM for to log investor calls. So those are a few things that, that we use. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. The book I recommend the most is How to Own Your Own Mind by Napoleon Hill. I mean, same guy who wrote How to Think and Grow Rich. Um, and this is more in depth, I think. And it, he's basically interviewing Andrew Carnegie. And I don't know if this was like the 40s or 50s, but it's very interesting because, you know, it talks about incentivizing people and capitalism and the dangers of socialism. And it's just very relevant now in, in popular culture, but also very relevant to real estate investing and, and how you need to think in order to achieve these big goals and overcome your fear. So how to, uh, how to Own Your Own Mind by Napoleon Hill is, is a great one. What's a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals? Yeah, I mean, every day um, I make sure I pray. So I'm Christian, I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. So I pray every day. Um, I was doing a better job of journaling, but I've kind of gotten off that to be honest. But even just kind of, you know, praying about my goals and, and saying them out loud helps a lot. What are you curious about right now? Um, we are gonna start a construction company. So we've been doing construction management. In the next six years, we're gonna start our own construction company so that we can control the, the labor. So we're gonna hire our own skilled labor. Our guy, John here is gonna be getting his GC license shortly. So honestly, we're curious to learn more about that. We're actually now sourcing all of our materials directly. So we're now making all of our vendors use our materials that we purchase in bulk so they can't kind of mark us up. So we're really trying to learn more and more about the construction arms so we can continue to build out that infrastructure. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were starting out? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, is trying to find the right partners. I spent the first six months trying to do everything myself and grinding along. And I felt like I was trying to sell people on this and, set, and like educate them. And then when I started going to conferences, and talking to guys like you, John, it was like, oh, you speak my language. And I collapsed the time frame significantly because I found complimentary partners who can do other aspects of the business who are you know, smarter than I am. And so I think that was the biggest thing is you have to get out there, go to conferences. Zoom is okay. I don't like Zoom, honestly. I don't, I don't think it brings a lot of value. Uh, I, I, it can for some people, but I think there's a lot more power to in-person meetings, especially in the beginning. Once you get established, maybe not so much, but you've got to get out there and meet people. All right, we've talked about Phoenix a lot during this conversation. Give me the best place to grab a bite. 
Oh man, so so my wife and I, we go to a place called Kovo, it's Greek food, K-O-V-O, um, in like Paradise Valley area, really, really good organic. So I would, I would check out Kovo. Love it. Listen, this yeah. has been a great conversation. Appreciate you sharing your journey from, you know, really coming out of the healthcare space, you know, working the sales job, leaving everything, taking a 14 months and letting your savings dwindle down to getting yeah. that first deal, grinding it out. And here you are now with over $200 million of assets under management and potentially another hundred or so million, you know, that you're working to close this year. Uh, wish you all the best. Again, if you want to learn more about Zach and his story, check him out at Rise48 Equity, R-I-Z-E 48equity.com. Zach, Great having you on the show. Take care, man. We'll talk again soon. Thanks so much, John. Really appreciate it, man. Good catching up.